Oh, what is viciously executing and publicly torturing my son of God? It's Good Friday. <laughs> Not when you listen to this. You'll listen to this weeks after Good Friday. Um, hi, Shireen. Lonnie Eunice. How, how are you doing? <laughs> hi, Robert. Robert Evans. Um, I'm okay. Robert's your middle name, right? Robert Robert. I'm Evans. not gonna <laughs> confirm or deny what my name is or isn't. I have a number of names, like most people, like mm. Jesus, who like also like Allah. Yeah, Allah. Has uh, a lot like of Allah, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Like our like our Lord and um, our sovereign Allah. Um, yeah, exactly. Like Ahura Mazda. Uh, like uh, Buddha. You know, there's all mm. sorts of everybody's this time of year for whatever reason. All the religions are like we should have a thing. You know, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll have us a Ramadan. We'll have us a Passover. We'll mm-hmm. have us a, an Easter. We're all, or at least all of the all of the Abrahamic faiths. I don't know if like I don't think anything Hindu's going on right now. I don't think right. anything Zoroastrian's going on. Anything yeah. anything uh, Buddhist? Probably not any Shinto stuff happening right now. But whatever, maybe mm-hmm. there is. It is yeah. like spring. We got a couple major ones up there. You know, although it's also I think it's like the dead of summer where a lot of those religions are. Mm-hmm. Uh, Southeast Asia. This is kind of like the hottest point of the. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Religion! Uh, Do you like religion, Shireen? No, please don't hate me, internet. Uh, no, I don't. I actually... That's fine. I I, I'm not a big fan myself. My teenager self would say, like, I despise uh, religion. I loathe it. It made me so angry. I hated it. And I think sure. I've, like, eased up on that language recently because I don't want to offend anybody. And, like, I realize for some people it's, like, meditative. And depending on the religion, it can really help people. It's not for me. I just I don't it's not, I don't like it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, like that's completely where I am too, uh, Shireen. Because like when I was a, a kid, I was a really angry atheist. Yes, exactly. You know, after not yes. when I was like when I was like eighteen, nine. I, I was like seventeen is kind of when I mm-hmm. decided I was an athe- atheist. But yeah, I started to get really angry about it as a, yeah. a, a a young adult, and I'm I'm not angry about it anymore, just because like. I've realized that all of the things that are shitty about religion are shitty about a bunch of stuff, yeah. and some people just choose to do shitty stuff. Yeah. And whether or not they use a religion to justify it, they'll find other things to justify it if it's not religion. But that's really beside the point today. <laughs> um, yeah. Shireen, it's not religion that's shitty, it's humans. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not even that they're shitty, it's just that shitty people will find reasons to do shitty things. Yes, exactly. Um, religion or not. Yeah, religion or not. It's it's just a thing that we do because we're cool. <laughs> um, speaking of, actually, this does tie in a bit to what we're talking a about bit. today. A good segue there's from some, Robert Evans? There's okay, some religion. It. There's definitely some religious stuff involved here. It's going to okay. be real uncomfortable. Um, Shireen, what do you know about Liberia? Liberia. Yeah. Nothing. I'm not, I was gonna that you to, are you are more or less you know, in the in the where most Americans are then. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, um, I know nothing about most things, so I'm excited to learn about you, Liberia today. You are you are aware that they had there's been a bunch of war there, right? Yes. Is this, yeah, you've kind of seen some. I'm aware at least that there's conflict and yeah. and tragedy Child and things soldiers. that my brain mm-hmm. sometimes turns off because I can only handle so much trauma but that's my luxury of being a privileged asshole you know what i mean well yeah it's it's very funny because like there's a bunch of places in the world where horrible things are going on um places like myanmar places like the democratic Mm -hmm. republic of the congo uh palestine um Mm -hmm. where people you know don't don't americans are, are able not to care because and to some degree, it's like, yeah, man, the world's fucking big. There's a lot of stuff going on. Like, right. I can't, no one can know about all of the bad things that are happening. And you can't, you shouldn't be expected to, like, be aware of every single terrible thing happening in the world. There's a particular reason why Americans ought to know more about Liberia. Um, and it's because we made Liberia. Now, <clears throat> mm-hmm. I'm going to talk, Shireen, today. The main subject of our episode is a fellow who went by the name General Butt Naked. Um, that's a, that's of truth. That th- is- that's, it's, it's pretty fun. It's pretty fun okay. name. Not a fun guy. 
Um, <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> not a fun guy. But he, he's one of those dudes, the broad strokes is that like he was this warlord, did a bunch of horrible stuff in the Liberian Civil War, fought naked, hence the name, and then afterwards repented. And there's been a bunch of documentaries about how he's he's a Christian preacher now and he's apologizing to all his victims. He's a grifter, in my opinion. Yes. But in order to properly talk about this guy, because a lot of the shit he did, there's a lot of witchcraft and sacrificing mm-hmm. babies and all sorts of fucked up shit. Um, oh, yeah. Well, but the, the thing is, like, that all sounds a lot more like, you know, there, there's a problematic history of particularly white dudes like me talking about <laughs> uh, witchcraft and occult practices in, in different African countries uh, and getting all like, oh, my God, they did this and they did that. Um, none of it is exactly the way that it seems with, like, the casual uh, uh, description of what's going on. So before we talk about General Butt Naked, we're going to have to spend an hour or so talking about the history of conflict in Liberia, where mm-hmm. it came from, and how shit like human sacrifice wound up getting kind of ground into the mix there. Wow. So, you yeah. ready? You ready for this? Buckle in? Uh, yeah, let me buck, click. Get your, yep, get your sad pants on. My what pants on? Sad pants? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're always on. Do I ever That's take good. those off? No. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the first enslaved African people from North America landed at Jamestown on August 20th, 1619. This is pretty famous because of that New York Times thing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of these folks were Angolans who had been captured by Portuguese slavers. In the centuries that followed, they and the Africans who followed them became an integral part of agriculture and economic viability in the colonies. When the United States became a thing, a number of the founding fathers, chiefly Thomas Paine, denounced slavery as a terrible evil that would one day tear the new nation apart. Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner himself, realized this when he wrote his notes on the state of Virginia in 1785. Here's what he had to say. Why not retain and incorporate the blacks into the state and thus save the expense of supplying by importation of white settlers the vacancies they will leave? Deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained, new provocations, the real distinctions which nature has made, and many other circumstances will divide us into parties and produce convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. So what he's he's talking about here is his idea that, like, if you're going to end slavery, you should send the black people who were brought here back to Africa. Right. Mm, That's ki- mm-hmm. kind of Thomas, because otherwise there will be inevitably be a race conflict. You okay. know, you you can't just keep them here if you're going to free them. That's Thomas Jefferson's attitude. And there's a number. He thinks that uh, black people were probably inferior to white people. Mm-hmm. Um, and he thinks that, again, there's just too much anger and whatnot. He also like does note that white people are probably too bigoted for it. It's a weird mix of things. He's a strange right. man. Um, now, others among his peers disagreed. There was an attitude among kind of abolitionists in this early period. Um, some felt that black people had just been temporarily degraded by slavery and they could be gradually uplifted to the point of social responsibility. This is still problematic, right? The idea that they need to be uplifted rather than just freed, but is generally better than the idea that they're, you know, genetically different. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, As the abolitionist movement picked up steam in the mid 1800s, advocates were often extremely racist themselves. Uh, Many abolitionists believed that freed black people could not exist or keep up in white society. Others like Jefferson just felt that there would be too much understandable anger over slavery for them to live alongside white people, which is not like an an unreasonable attitude to be like, well, shit, why would they want to hang out here? Like after all the fucked up shit. I mean, it's mostly just like they're fearful for their own lives, right? Like, oh, the minute they are able to, they're going to come after us for us treating them like actual animals. You know what I mean? I I, I think there's a mix of that. I think there's some people who are honest abolitionists and for the time very racially progressive who Mm -hmm. just like can't imagine them wanting to. Right. Um, And obviously, like one of the problems you'll hear again and again is a lot of people who are abolitionists are not great at actually listening to black people. That's a problem the whole abolitionist movement has. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are better at it than others. But it's like a thing that happens at periods of time. Um, So, yeah, all of these discussions are going on late 1700s, early 1800s as this abolitionist movement is building up steam. And some of the people who are for abolition start to advocate for a sort of sponsored immigration program to send freed black slaves out of the United States and back to Africa. And so this is not they're, they're advocating for abolition in the United States, but they're also saying we've got all these free black people. We should create a colony in Africa 
for them to send them back to. And that once we start freeing more slaves, those people can go to that colony, right? Uh Um, One of these men was Pennsylvania reformer John Parrish. He advocated manumitting, that means freeing slaves, and sending them back home where they could experience, quote, liberty and the rights of citizenship without being particularly near him. Uh, His hope (laughs) was that sending over a small number of black folks would convince other free black people to leave North America, and that this would somehow inspire the better nature of slave owners to free their own people. Quote, many persons of humanity who continue to hold slaves would be willing to liberate them on condition of their so removing. You get what he's saying? He's not, he's actually kind of saying the same thing Jefferson was because Jefferson was arguing like, well, you can't just free him and have him stay here, you know, otherwise it'll be a problem. So Parrish is being like, well, obviously maybe a lot of these slave owners are really good people. They just see that they've, it's too dangerous to let these people (laughs) be free. So we have to, it's very racist again, but it's also not a kind of racism in America that we talk about a lot because a lot of this history has been kind of brushed over. I mean, yeah, it's like kind of backwards because you're like, they're not saying like, oh my God, controlling another human is terrible because you're still controlling them. You're still like, okay, let's well, shoot them are, out. You know, let's they shoot are, them out. They are saying that. They're just saying it's not the worst thing. Right, exactly. Like, that, like freeing them would be, right? Because like, they yeah. are saying it's bad to have slaves, but they're just saying it's worse to, you know, yeah. again, very racist, just kind of a type of racism we maybe don't talk about enough that existed yeah. in this period. Um So he felt like a lot of slave owners didn't want slaves. They just kind of inherited them and they were scared about what black people would do if they were free, Mm. Um, which is a very silly thing to think. Um, In December of 1816, a mix of people with good, bad, racist and only slightly racist intentions formed the American Colonization Society. Now, part of this group, some of these people are very legitimately just like. Again, if you're like a civil rights advocate, you're born into the mid 1800s, you see this nightmare system. I can see a ways that a decent person would be like, maybe this is the best thing. Maybe providing these people like it's so racist here. It's so hard for them. Maybe if we tried to set them up with a place nice back in Africa, this would not be this would be a more ethical situation than having to live with all these fucking horrible racists. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people in the American colonization society society are like that. However, It is primarily a dark money organization funded by slave owners. Um, And what's going on here is that powerful slave owners want to push the idea of an African colony for freed slaves because this will remove free black people out of the Americas and free black people they see as like competition for slave labor that they can profit from. (laughs) Wait, competition for slave labor? Repeat yeah, that. they've so, got slaves, which is free labor. Yeah, but free black people because they, you know, work for less than free white people because mm. of racism. Right. That's competition for low paying work that otherwise will go to their slaves that they just profit. From. I see. OK. You know. Wow. Yes. Yes. I what think they threat. also see it as like a safety valve because, again, they're really racist. They understand that like some states black people are going to get free, but they don't want them sticking around because as long as there are free, free black people in North America, that's a body of people who are going to organize well, yeah. to abolish slavery, that's, that's right? Why the there's a few invented, reasons, right? Like, yes. Yeah, so it's yeah. So there's a number of reasons why slave owners really like the idea of a colony in Africa for free slaves. And that their dark money is kind of funding the American colonization society. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, and again, this group, the, the there are abolitionists in this group, but it's not committed to abolition. Um, I want to quote now from a write up on the American. Uh, uh, I want to quote now from a write up on the African American Intellectual History Society's Black Perspectives blog by mm-hmm. by Nicholas Guyet. Quote, its origins and trajectory always evinced a watery commitment to abolition. Two facts made this commitment supremely insidious. First, it placed the burden of ending slavery on the benevolent slaveholders themselves, who would supposedly free their slaves when provided with an outlet for doing so. Second, it marked an epic endorsement of racial segregation, effectively denying the possibility of coexistence while promoting what would later be termed separate but equal. So you can see the the roots of a couple of really fucked up things in the American colonization society. Now, before the souring of sectional relations in the 1830s and 1840s, colonization also supplied a bridge between mainstream anti-slavery sentiments in both North and South. The ACS opened auxiliary societies from New England through North Carolina when upper Southern legislatures engaged with the question of ending slavery, invariably they identified a black colony as the prerequisite for general emancipation. Only the Deep South became a no-go zone for colonization enthusiasts, with white politicians, editors, and businessmen mobilizing their considerable power against even a featherlight anti-slavery challenge. In New England, by contrast, colonization retained a considerable appeal through the first years of the Civil War. So 
colonization is popular, pro proper in like these kind of progressive, you might say like liberal chunks of the North where mm -hmm. abolition is, it's a, and that's why slavery enthusiasts don't want any discussion of this in the South, right? Because it's even a little bit of, of abolitionist tendency is too much for them. But they love pushing this in the North because it's a lot, if you can get people focusing on this, they're not focusing on abolishing slavery, mm -hmm. which would actually hurt them, right? Right, right. You get what's yeah. going on here? Yeah. So the chief accomplishment of the American Colonization Society was the establishment of the colony of Liberia on Africa's west coast. It was founded in 1821 by a group of roughly 10,000 free black migrants who took one look at the U.S. in the 1820s and figured, well, shit, anywhere's better than here, right? Like, <laughs> for, from the point of view of these guys who are leaving and ladies who are leaving, it's like, yeah, of course. Like, I get why you wouldn't want to stick around North America right about now. Yeah. It doesn't seem like there's a, <laughs> that's a safe bet. Um, the first first big wave of immigration to Liberia was, yeah, about 10,000 people. And this this occurs over a period of time from 1822 to 1841 in several successive waves. Uh, and yeah. these these migrants formed several towns on the coast with names like Robertsport, Monrovia, Buchanan and Greenville. Although I think their initial Monrovia's first capital name is Christopolis. Christopolis. Wow. Yep, that was the first name. Very funny. Very funny. Um, although it's not going to be funny, actually, because, I mean, yeah. spoilers, colonialism. Yeah. So, because of racism, these, these, these black people who have gone to Liberia are not actually the masters of their own domain at first. Liberia is a colony of the United States, and the new immigrants are ruled by a white governor who appoints white officials. Wow. Uh, <laughs> now, the new residents of the city did have a legislative council that they got to vote for, and their own elected representatives who work with the governor, right? So they do have representation, certainly more than they did in the United States at the mm -hmm. time, right? But final approval for all actions voted for by the council pinned it on approval by a board of managers for the colonization society who lived in Washington, D.C. Oh so if the if the black people living there voted for something, they had to send it back across the Atlantic to get ratified by this council who could also annul laws. So they basically um, just like they they leave these plantations that are enslaved and in the states and they go to this just giant island plantation. Oh boy, you have predicted some of where this is going. Oh no. Um, <laughs> but not for them actually. But yeah, there there is like this is obviously very fucked up. It, it's in keeping though with their the idea of some of these these dudes that like you, they need to be trained up before they can run their own country, right? Mm. That's that's why they're doing it this way. That's why the the white people are doing it this way. Right. You're right. You're um okay very so and, now it is yeah. the the good news is that anytime they send a dude over there a white dude over there to help govern the colony that motherfucker dies immediately right because there's <laughs> all sorts of there's all sorts of bugs and shit that are biting oh. white people they get right like there's all sorts of <laughs> shit that like kills white people in africa in this period because we don't have I good medicine that, like, this, yeah they're just dropping the like flies in the world <laughs> yeah. like, killed can't like handle bite. a fucking mosquito it's bite so yeah. <laughs> white ass motherfuckers <laughs> I got a sunburn! Um, Ow! Mm -hmm. No, it's so funny. Okay. Yeah, so the, these guys keep dying, um, which is a real problem. It makes it difficult for them to, like, run the colony the way they want to. It makes it hard for them to have p white people to report back to D.C. Um, and beyond that, the society, after the, the earliest years, runs into a funding crunch. Um, so part of this is because they stop getting donations because abolitionists wake up to the fact that this is a dark money thing for slave owners. Part of this is that, like, the, the conflict over slavery gets nastier and slave owners stop putting like they start putting money elsewhere right so starting in the 1840s white oversight of liberia starts to peel away liberians begin to agitate for total autonomy and when the last white governor dies in 1841 they get it the society appoints a black governor joseph roberts who became the first not white person to run things in liberia now the colony then at this point you know stops being a colony not really a colony after this moment and is it becomes an independent nation in July of 1847. Okay. And if that had been all that happened Sherbeen this would be one of the less depressing stories in the history of oh, slavery. God damn it Robert. Here's the thing. Now you send 10,000 black people in America pretty much all born in the United States as slaves. You, 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 some of them born free, but you, you take these, these black Americans and you send them to the west coast of Africa to set up cities. Now, are you seeing any pot potential problems here? Uh, 
Well, I mean, are there already? Wait, I'm confused. Were there already people on Liberia? Oh yes, before this? there sure okay. were. Is that is <laughs> am, I, am I in the right there direction here? There absolutely were okay. were people there before. Okay, yeah, I, I there, think I understand there where it's going. One hundred percent were people there. I um, mean, I'm sounding like people that don't understand yeah. about Palestine. Of course, the yeah, people in Palestine. Yeah, yeah. There's a ton of people there. Okay, and great, like, great. Again, these 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 dudes, the, the, these, um, these migrants are obviously these people were stolen from somewhere in Africa, or at least mm. their ancestors were right. Um, but they're from like potentially all over, like certainly mm-hmm. not, uh, Liberia in specific generally. And also they're, Amer- they speak English, they're Christian. They dress like Americans. They're, they have been yeah. living well, free in U S you know? cities. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So these are, This is not a case of like these people returning to their homeland. These people are colonizing Liberia. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you know anything about (laughs) colonization, it's not nice. No, no, it's not. <laughs> um, and, and this was not suddenly fine just because the guys doing the colonization in Africa were, were black. It's, it's still pretty messy. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm going to quote now from an article by M. M. B. Akpan in the Canadian Journal of African Studies titled Black Imperialism. Quote, The settlers constituted the rulers who ran the Liberian government in much the same way as the British and French constituted rulers in neighboring colonial territories like Sierra Leone and the Ivory Coast. However, actual power rested in the hands of prominent members of certain leading settler families or lineages in a manner that that maintained some balance of power among the families. The settlers on whom the government of Liberia thus devolved as from 1841 were essentially American rather than African in outlook and orientation. They retained a strong sentiment attachment to America, which they regarded as their native land. They wore the Western mode of dress, which they had become accustomed in America, however unsuitable this dress was to Liberia's tropical weather. A black silk topper and a long black frock coat for men, and a Victorian silk gown for women. They built themselves frame, stone, or brick porticoed houses of one and a half to two stories, similar to those of the plantation owners in the southern states of America. And they preferred American food, like flour, cornmeal, butter, lard, pickled beef, bacon, and American-grown rice— large quantities of which they imported annually, to African foodstuff like cassava, plantain, yams, palm oil, sweet potatoes, and country rice grown by Africans in the Liberian hinterland. They were Christians, spoke English as their mother tongue, and practiced monogamy. They held land individually in contrast with the communal ownership of the African population, and their political institutions were modeled on those of America, with an elected president and a legislature made up of a Senate and a House of Representatives, so that in spite of their color, they were, as a rule, as foreign and lacking in sentimental attachment to Africa. Africa, as were European colonialists elsewhere in Africa, like the British, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spaniards. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, really stirring the pot here. I mean, like, it just, they're like conduits or like vessels for still like white agendas, it sounds like, like even if they don't mean to be. I mean, it's not so much white as like Western, because obviously oh, yeah. they're not I mean, white. I guess, um, for me, it's interchangeable. I know that's a mistake, but yes, yeah. Yeah, yes. th- but th- they are very much, they are Westerners, and they see to a large extent, the people who had been living in Liberia as like backwards, um, devil-worshipping weirdos who don't Mm -hmm. deserve political rights, right? So the indigenous Liberians don't get to vote in the same Whoa. way that like, oh, yeah, like no. they're all, they are oh, shut out no. <laughs> to a significant extent, at least from the oh. franchise. Right. Um, and if you're thinking, boy, howdy, I bet this caused a problem somewhere down the line. Then good news. <laughs> you're right on the money. Over the next half century and change, the Americo Liberians became an oligarchy, practicing what one historian called a, quote, sort of sub imperialism at African expense. By 1900, about 15,000 black American immigrants had settled in Liberia, along with around 300 immigrants from the West Indies. Liberia is often claimed in 20th century history books uh, as one of two African states that remained independent during the scramble for Africa, the other being Ethiopia. But this is not quite a- accurate. Ethiopia is for sure. But Liberia was a colony that just became independent in 1847, like mm-hmm. certainly a lot earlier than other colonies did, because most of Africa hadn't been colonized in 1847. But the fact that it was not recolonized doesn't really mean anything because it was already a colony. Right, right. Um, And the actual indigenous people in Liberia were a subclass within their own homeland with very little economic or political power. The Americo-Liberians held all of the power, and their Americo-Liberian Whig Party was essentially the only legal political party in the country from 1860 to 1980. 
Despite the fact that immigrant-descended Liberians made up only 2% of the population, they effectively turned the rest of the country into a profit-making engine for themselves. In 1931, an international commission found that several prominent Americo-Liberians had enslaved indigenous Africans. No. So, yeah, uh, the West is pretty... It's a fucking pretty, virus. Pretty, pretty, yeah, it, it, does, it, does, it does work that way sometimes. God. You know what else people in- is a virus, Shireen? <sighs> Raising on. It, it, it is yeah. a virus. It is a virus <laughs> uh, that keeps our democracy uh, functioning in a healthy manner. Like mm-hmm. the Epstein-Barr virus, you know? You can't get enough of it. Just no. nom, nom, nom. Good Shoot and tasty. Shoot me up, yeah. Uh-huh. That's what everyone says about the Epstein-Barr virus. Anyway, (laughs) here's some ads. Oh, we're back. We're we're really enjoying that message from our sponsors, the Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. Catch it tomorrow. Anyway, um, so if you want a good example of how (laughs) like... Sorry, what? I just looked up Sophie, and saw Sophie the, shake the, her head. The good, the good people at the the Epstein Bar virus paid us serious money for that plug. What, what, you, whatever, you ignore whatever them. Whatever makes you happy, Robert. That, that does make me happy. <laughs> I'd be happier if everybody went and got the Epstein Bar virus. Let's, let's let's move on from the bit. I think. I think. Is that should we move on from the bit? Is yeah, it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we've gotten the bit. We got the. I'm bit. gonna yeah, look yeah. up what the Epstein Bar virus does because <laughs> I've forgotten. After all uh, that time. Yeah, well, you know, I, I just remember the name. I'm so lucky, or like, I'm so oh, grateful. Oh, it's like, uh, it's the herpes virus, I guess. Oh, wait, Ooh. no, it's mono. Is it mono? I don't know. Let's, let's, let's ignore. Let's, yeah, let's I think it's mono. Yep, it's mono. Yep. Say it for the 17th time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that good shit. Um, yeah, so get mono. Everybody get mono. Okay, yeah. Sophie, oh. how, how we doing? You happy? You happy with me as a podcaster? No. You, you glad you made this series of choices in your life that led to you <laughs> sitting here while a guy talks about how everyone should get mono on a podcast about Liberia? Kind you of. You psyched? Kind of, actually. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I was going to say, even though Sophie is like not, she's like, wasn't talking. Like, I'm just so glad her camera's always on because mm-hmm. I can just like, every time you say something, I can just look up and I know Sophie's like, we connect, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> she shakes her we head connect. and I'm like, yes. We connect, and you know what? Connecting is how people okay. get mono. Robert, anyway, next, what? <laughs> move on from the bit. Okay, try to make a, a good segue example. Out of this. So we're yeah. talking about uh, like mono uh, colonization spreads, like the colonial mindset and the imperial mindset spreads from the United States to Liberia. That is as very do impressive, actually. That what's is a really great fucked segue. up, as we noted, like some of these Americo Liberians take slaves from the native Africans for themselves. They also create a plantation. I mean, several, but there's one in particular we're going to talk about right now, Um, because this really highlights how fucked up some of the stuff going on here is. Um, Starting in the 1920s, the Firestone Corporation starts a massive rubber plantation in Liberia, which profits, obviously, the 2% of people who are Americo-Liberian, that sprawls from the coast to, like, the hills of central Liberia. Um, It's this, like, massive thousands and thousands of acres um, with people, like, living on it, harvesting rubber, rubber for very little money. Um, and have very little control over their own lives, like indigenous wow. people laboring day in and day out to harvest the rubber that makes the tires and like the cars that first start wow. filling American streets. Um, it's pretty cool. I'm going to quote from a write up in ProPublica. At the center of this kingdom was House 53, reserved for the plantation boss. It stood on a hill overlooking the rest of the plantation, a two-story antebellum-style Georgian colonial mansion of pink brick. It had a wide porch, six white Corinthian columns, and Jalousie windows. Other homes for expatriates featuring verandas and manicured gardens were scattered nearby in a section of the plantation known as Harble Hills. There was a nine-hole golf course, tennis courts, and a country club with a bar. About three miles down the road was Harble, Firestone's own company town, a portman formed from the names of the business's founder, Harvey S. Firestone Sr., and his wife, Ida Bell. It held Firestone's central office, industrial garages, and a latex-practicing plant redolent of ammonia and other chemicals. The town itself was a collection of tin-roofed homes and shops, a grocery store, a bank, schools, and brick and cinder block bungalows for mid-level Liberian managers and domestic staff. There were the homes of the tappers, the Liberian workers who did the hard work of extracting the latex sap from the trees. The camps were long, uh, 
but low rows of residences, almost like coops. Units generally consisted of a single room. The homes had wattle and daub walls and aluminum roofs. There were no windows and no kitchens. The work camps had communal pumps for water and outdoor kitchens for cooking. There was no electricity. Bathrooms were outhouses or the nearby bush. There was the wor- This was the world of the Firestone operation, described in, a ni- in 1990 by one company executive as resembling an old southern plantation. Wow. So fucking George H.W. Bush is in the White House and white people are running a plantation in Africa um, with the collusion of the Americo-Liberian government where the workers there are just a couple of steps above being enslaved. That was like yesterday. Yeah. Real recent. (laughs) And when the Civil War starts... (sighs) Firestone's company representatives are going to make some cool choices about this is like Firestone, how, Firestone. To, how to help. Yeah, this is Firestone. Tire, rubber. Fi- yeah, okay, this I is understand. where the rubber yeah, yeah, comes from. A, a plantation yeah, yeah. in Africa. <sighs> so that's neat. Um, mm-hmm, now, neat. Y- you, know. you will not be surprised to hear that an awful lot of Liberians, and I, I mean like indigenous Liberians, were not jazzed with the status quo, right? People have problems with it. Um, it not was jazzed, a pretty, yes, totally, yeah, at least. <laughs> yeah, not psyched. Uh, it was it was you have to give it though a, a really effective system because Liberia kind of if you treat the Americo Liberian rule as a colonial project, it lasts longer than basically any other African colony, Do other than like because, South Africa, arguably like that's right. Uh, yeah, but, maybe it's because like people are never taught about it or like, like you know what I mean. It went under the radar because no one even knew it was there. Well, I don't know. I think there's a, a number of factors here, and I just like, don't know enough um, about. It. I mean, most I think I think very little of this history is known to Americans. Right. Like, it's not something we really talk about. I remember vaguely hearing that one of the like it, I remember in like a textbook I had in high school that was talking about like abolition movement pre Civil War. There was like a little box in like one of the pages that summarized like the American Colonization Society and the colonizing of Liberia in like four paragraphs, <laughs> and like that was just kind of it. That like oh, some people went over there. Right, this was one right, thing right, that folks right. tried. Like. I don't I didn't I didn't hear this. I didn't learn anything about like right. the 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 again like black imperialism is the title of one of the and obviously it's not I don't think it's I think they're using that to kind of uh, uh elicit a reaction. This is still in a lot of ways white imperialism. It's just using black people yeah, because exactly. there's a huge financial benefit and a military benefit which we'll discuss mm-hmm. later to the United States because Liberia functions this way. Yeah. Um so yeah, uh, it's a pretty effective system. Uh, the Americo Liberians remain in charge until 1980, when things begin to go terribly wrong. The last president that the oligarchy was able to successfully keep in power, well, install in power, I should say, was a guy named William Tolbert. Uh, his administration was severely weakened early on due to a series of rice riots in uh, the end of the 1970s. And by early 1980, his ability to stay in power or was teetering on the brink. Because you might guess there were like there was a lot of hunger. Pe- poor people who are right, indigenous yeah. Liberians generally are starving. They riot because they want food. The government cracks down on it brutally. They arrest a bunch of organizers. Um, but, you know, they 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 beat this down, but their their hold on power is not secure. Um, Tober does not seem to have been a very bright dude because he's not entirely aware of how shaky his position is. He and his fellow oligarchs um, felt like they had control, mostly locked down, because all of the officers in the Liberian military were were Americo Liberian. You could not be an indigenous Liberian and be an oh. officer. Now, here's what's interesting. All of the enlisted men are indigenous. Um, and so all of like the sergeants and corporals are indigenous men. This is exactly the same way. We talked about years ago, I did an episode on Idi Amin, who becomes the dictator of Uganda, which is a British colony after the British come out. And, and Idi Amin was like the highest ranking native African military officer in the military in Uganda when the British left. And he was a sergeant because the way the British military worked in Africa, all of your officers are white dudes. All of the enlisted men are, are black Africans. Right. So the people Um, that could die are usually not white. Yes. uh, But also the, the officers are the ones who are supposed to be able to do the coordinating and the actual Mm. like executing of military operations. Um, So that's part of why you don't want indigenous people to be officers, because then they'll have sergeants are never supposed to have command over big units of guys. Right. Like that's a thing for 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 captains and majors and colonels and whatnot. Um, 
so you can see that the Liberian militaries organized the same way that like the British and the French organized their mm -hmm. colonial militaries. Um, and because again, Idi Amin was a sergeant before he became dictator, when Liberia has its civil war and the government gets overthrown, it's going to be a sergeants who do the overthrowing because that's as high as you can rise in the military as mm. an indigenous person. Um, so Tolbert was so convinced that he was in a secure position that he started doing the one thing an oligarchic leader of what is effectively a U.S.-backed dictatorship should never do. He starts to fuck with the U.S., um, see, the U.S. Department of Defense had come to expect we liked Liberia in part because there's a bunch of benefits, financial benefits. U.S. companies make a lot of money, cheap labor, get rubber and shit from Liberia. Um, but also the U.S. has a bunch of fuckery we get up to in Africa, right? We got a ton of shit going on in Africa, especially in this period. Um, and Liberia we say, hey, we need to land some fucking planes. We got to keep some Marines there. We need to keep like a rapid deployment force or whatever. In the past, Liberia is always like, absolutely, send as many troops as you want. Say, like, land your planes here. Fly out of here. You're good mm -hmm. to go. We're buddies, you know? Because intelligent people who are part of this oligarchy recognize that the United States being in your pocket is basically the best thing you can right. do in terms well, of staying in power. Well, why does he decide power? to fuck with the U.S. exactly? What's, what's, what does he think is the benefit of that? Um, I, I, I don't think he's a very bright dude. I, I'm going to admit I'm not the most knowledgeable on this, but it's, it's generally reviewed, regarded as kind of a baffling decision, but he's also mm -hmm. like, um, you know, there's, there's a, the, the U S is kind of like, I think withholding some, um, some, uh, aid funding and stuff uh, mm -hmm. out of civil rights concerns. So there's like, there's some pressure being put on his regime, I think by the U S and he decides to like push back in this way. Um, this proves to be a really bad call because when uh, he basically DC decides we want a new US rapid deployment force in Liberia um, and they ask permission and Tolbert is like, no. Uh, so then the CIA and the Department of Defense are like, well, why do we want this guy in power right, now? Let's right? Like, this doesn't Easy. benefit us at all. Yeah. Um, who have we, well, they try to. It's kind of debatable as to how much of an impact they really have on this, but they certainly start thinking about it and they start going through some names of like what what sergeants and whatnot in the in the Liberian military do we think could like overthrow the government? Um, it was generally assumed Liberia doesn't have much in the way of other political parties yet, so there's not really an established opposition. So it was assumed the army is the best place to actually get some kind of revolutionary leader mm -hmm. um they're not really able to move forward unless the situation changes though and that change starts to come courtesy of the progressive alliance of liberia an advocacy group which decides to become a political party in 1980 they start holding events uh and talk spread that tolbert's regime was planning to execute a bunch of the organizers of the riots who were still imprisoned on the one year anniversary of the rice riots to like kind of solidify power, threaten these people. Um, so this inspires a lot of local Liberians to do something ahead of that date. Uh, and it's very likely that the CIA had some sort of, I don't think we know exactly what, they were certainly talking about overthrowing Tolbert, and then it happens. It's again, I can't tell you exactly their role here, but what happens is that a group of 17 soldiers, mostly sergeants, uh, which is the highest rank that Liberians could hold, um, attempt to launch a coup ahead of that anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to quote now from the Liberian Civil Wars by Charles River Editors. The senior ranking member of the coup party, although not at leader was Master Sergeant Samuel Doe, an almost entirely unknown figure. The decision was rather spontaneous and aided by alcohol. The party set off on the evening of the 11th, fully armed, and made its way to the foot of the Barclay Training Center towards Capitol Hill and the Executive Mansion. The streets were unlit, and entry to the grounds of the mansion was gained without challenge. At about 0100 hours on the morning of the 12th, the coup party broke into the basement, also without encountering any challenge, and cautiously entered the upstairs section. Now, purely by chance, it turns out that President Tolbert had been out at a Baptist convention. He was a <laughs> preacher, uh, so he had been preaching at this convention. Twist! And instead of going back to his compound, he decides to go back and sleep at the Capitol building that night. Mm. So he's in his bathroom in his pajamas when he hears gunfire, which is the coup members assaulting his guards. The whole thing is very messy. It ends with Tolbert, his teenage nephew, and a bunch of guards all executed brutally. These are oh. very violent killings. Um, when Tolbert's body is discovered the next day, his corpse was found mutilated. As best as anyone can tell, a corporal named Harrison Pinno had shot him in the head after Tolbert attempted to bribe him. For more detail, I'm going to turn again to the quote from that book, The Liberian Civil Wars. Quote, 
After the shooting, Corporal Penno was asked what he thought he was doing, and his reply was that he wanted to see Tolbert die in order to debunk a, gr- a generally held belief that the president was a witch doctor. The idea of leadership allied to sorcery remains common enough in Africa, and most Liberian leaders tended to, fo- to allow mythology of that nature to pass, since it added to the mystique of their rule. Tolbert habitually carried a short ivory-tipped cane, and the belief was that it was carved from the femur of a human leg bone. It was remarked by one soldier that if Tolbert had laid the cane down, he would not have been killed, but it is unlikely that he was carrying any ceremonial accoutrement at that particular moment. Regardless, three more bullets were put in his head, just to ensure the job was done, and with that, the 19th president of the Liberian Republic lay dead on the floor of his bedroom in a pool of blood. So Fascinating. he gets disemboweled after this. At some point after he's killed, his guts get removed, which is, again, seen as like the best way to kill a witch doctor. Mm-hmm. It is hard to say who did this because after the coup proved successful, these 17 initial dudes are joined by like 100 other soldiers. They find the president's liquor cabinet and they all just get shithouse drunk and go on a killing spree. Right. They just start murdering like anybody associated with the old government, right? Well, yeah. So this is gnarly. It's also like... You're part of an oppressed class. You're used as cannon fodder by the government. Like, you have no rights, and you get a chance to murder them all. Historically, you murder them all. Right, Um, yeah. This is not the only place something like this has happened. Uh, So, we're going to talk a lot more about disembowelment, cannibalism, and other similar subjects. But we should probably discuss what those things mean in a Liberian context. Because, again, Mm. a lot of this stuff gets, like, over, like, focused on by uh, foreigners talking about, like, this conflict and being like, oh, my God, there's cannibals and witch doctors. Talk about why that exists and what that means. Are we going to talk about witchy stuff? A little bit, yeah. We are okay. going to talk about um, this partic- the particular part of West Africa where the Liberian colony is established has a history of a practice called gaboyo. Uh, mm-hmm. And gaboyo is a practice whereby people are killed so that their body parts can be used as sacrifices to magically obtain certain benefits. Now, one like local news source is kind of like a, a West African news source described this as an ancient practice and notes that li- Liberian elites, which generally means the Americo Liberians, never really attempted to like find ways to stop this and never really worked on a good way for how to do it. Um, and since they tended to be Christian and kind of dicks, um, indigenous practices developed a degree of gravity as like acts of resistance to the oligarchy. Mm-hmm. A version of this happens in Haiti, right? Where a lot of these traditional practices become associated with resistance right, right. to the colonial regime. Now, also, that local source I found, scholars will quibble with aspects of that because, again, as was noted above, Tolbert, who's Americo Liberian, and other presidents would definitely like signpost to some of these kind of yeah, beliefs about it made witchcraft. Them a little bit invincible or like like this the mystique that you yeah, said, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um so anyway, the fact that a lot of these these kind of traditional like Gaboyo, this traditional practice, is seen as kind of a resistance practice to the Christian and like very Western regime. Um this seems to have caused what had been very fairly uncommon practices, spiritual practices before colonization oh. to grow and mutate. I, University, okay. yeah, because this is what happens in Liberia. All of the shit we're going to be talking about that happens in the Civil War, all these really fucked up practices, these are, a lot of people will argue, did not really exist in the same fashion yeah. prior to colonization. Yeah, they were, they were like, in response to being colonized and oppressed, they were like, we should latch on to these things that are becoming this form of resistance. Yeah, And they're also, they're going to change over time. So University of Wisconsin professor Florence Bernot um, writes that, quote, public rumors depict human sacrifice and often related sorceries as the most common way to achieve personal success, wealth, and prestige in times of economic shortage and declining social opportunities. Political leaders are widely believed to perform ritual murder to ensure electoral success and power, and many skillfully use these perceptions to build visibility and deference. So people like a lot of these these rulers in this period like aren't necessarily doing these things, but they are kind of signaling that they do, which mm-hmm. leads to a, an increased belief that there's some efficacy to this. Oh, and Berno notes that rather being a truly ancient practice, Gaboyo and other similar practices have roots in the past, but are influenced in their modern forms by the extractive nature of colonialism. 
Quote, the colonial situation reveals significant contradictions in the Western fiction of a modern disconnect between body and power. The series of political and moral transgressions triggered by the conquest made apparent how Europeans themselves envisioned political survival as a form of positive exchange revolving around the body fetish. In the colony, black and white bodies became resacralized as political resources. Think about how in the... But can you explain, wait, what do, what do you mean body fetish? Like, like are you saying the, like... The, fetish is kind of like a a, a, a religious term for like a, an object of sort of like worship like or of, at least of, of spiritual of, yeah. focus. Okay, that's you like know? needed to... Okay, I understand that, but like so, that's so... Think about one of... So one of the things pe- people talk about like cannibalism in the Congo and one thing they'll point out is that a lot of these practices were influenced or even have their origin in what the Belgians were doing and taking the hands of people who did not like harvest oh. enough rubber because like so what they're pointing out is that like... Like, well, from the perspective of these people living in this region, Europeans are engaging in the same acts. They're taking right. pieces of human bodies and they are yeah. using them to gain power in like, some way. Trophies Why wouldn't that something. work? For, well, it's like you, you get power by taking somebody's hand from them, right? You get power over the whole community, you know, the, as mm-hmm. this threat. How is that any meaningfully different than like you kill somebody and you take take a part of their body part right. and like eat it or whatever. Like you can see a relation between those two things and you can see how like the 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 extractive nature of colonial capitalism on these people in influences these ideas of like sacrificing and taking pieces of the body in order to gain power. You know, it's That's not so this is not evolving in a the point that these scholars this doesn't these practices don't aren't they're not novel. It's not just people doing what they've been doing for thousands yeah. of years. They they have evolved and changed over the right. period of colonization as much as everyone has. Um, and so have these practices. And these practices cannot be extricated from from capitalism or from co- colonization, right? Um, yeah. So, so by the time Sergeant Doe and his allies overthrow the government, these practices have become, quote, not a marginal, but a central dimension of the nature of public authority, leadership, and popular identities. And this is going to cause a lot of real nasty problems. But you know what else is going to cause some real nasty problems, <laughs> Shireen? Uh, Epstein Barr virus? It, oh boy, howdy. <laughs> Let me tell you the Epstein I'm sorry, Bar virus. Sophie, I should have brought it back. I'm sorry. Causes the problem of having a good time. Look, everybody loves a little bit of mono. Smooch, smooch. Mm hmm. It was very popular in my high school. Me too, actually. Yeah. All, all the kids loved it. Mm hmm. All right, here's some ads. Ah, uh, we're back and and continue to be the only podcast with the courage to be supported by mononucleosis. Oh my God. Yeah, I, that look, was my well, That's it, on me. Sophie, it's on me. I, it's I on, take responsibility. It is. It is. Look, <laughs> it, it, fucking NPR's whatever thing they do, the daily, that New York Times podcast, uh-huh. those fucking cowards would never be sponsored <laughs> by the Epstein Barr virus. Cowards. Cowards. All of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I will I say, say, though, like, there's an impulse that I won't. I won't uh, entertain like this, this fascination with physical body and power and like what that means, like on a uh, philosophical level. Like I'm so fascinated by that. And I, I, I said this before on other podcasts, but there's always a, t- a tendency I have in any podcast I guest on to just become philosophizing. And I won't do that this time, but I will say I have the impulse too because it's very fascinating when you think about that overlap and that connection. Cause it's like, so i don't know what it is it's it's just fucking why i would i don't know i don't know what the word is i would really encourage people to read um some of what bruno has written on um florence bruno uh b-e-r-n-a-u-l-t i think that's how it's pronounced uh from the university of wisconsin um because there's a lot of like writing on this not just in liberia because like versions of this are, are recognized in other colonies but it is really we've we talked about it a bit in some of our congo episodes it is a really fascinating dimension and it also you you often get from not not just from racists because obviously racists be racisting but from like people who don't who are racist but don't want to frame themselves that way talking mm-hmm. about like problems in Africa as like well you do have this problem of like you've got this ancient and and culture that has some really savage dimensions right. and you know that Ancient, you know, this I mean, is yeah, a problem like, in like yeah. Liberia of like attaining any kind of peace and it's like well Actually, those practices aren't, a, they are evolved from ancient practices, but they're very much rooted in the shit that, like, was done to these people to make them a productive rubber plantation, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. It's, uh, 
That part yeah. does not get it gets glossed over. You know what I mean? It it's, really it's, it's, there's it like really savage practices. You know, should be discussed. Like yeah. this, it, it, they are not any more savage than slavery and then colonialism you oh, know yeah. like they're just, just like, nastier looking because we, there's a lot of value put in kind of like yeah making the plantations that's why people have weddings at plantations right yeah. because like you're a slave like, owner you dress it up more it but. is so embarrassing how many like friends of friends or whatever just the, the photos of like having a wedding on a plantation makes me want to vomit but like why do why why is it glossed over that like lynching happened and yeah. like all these things and like it's still it still fucking happens you know what i mean like these violent acts that are I, so I w- disgusting it's i will say it right here i think killing a dude in battle and eating his heart is a thousand times less gross than forcing a man to labor for you until he dies 100 percent agree yes way less gross yeah <laughs> the, god that's i don't know i fucking people man i don't know yeah like also like body power all this stuff it's also in every culture, not every culture. I can like think of a few cultures that uh, still incorporate this like fascination with like someone like taking a part of someone's body to demonstrate your power over them. Like look, look at yeah, samurai. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just like there's like and I can I want to deep dive into this off air. There's but, like, there's it's somebody so there's I mean a lot has been written. This is really a fascinating thing to read into. We're not gonna. I don't I don't want to pretend we're doing anything but scratching the surface but it is important to scratch the surface because when we read these lurid stories of like child sacrifice and cannibalism you need to know that it's more complicated than just like look at this fucked up thing they do in liberia right this fucked up thing these non-white people have done all the time because they're uncivilized or whatever it's like it's important to understand that it's like it's part of a continuum of violence and it's not the it's it's an ugly it's certainly bad but it's not like it's not the start of it and it's not the part that has caused the most harm at scale yeah agree um, okay I'm gonna by the up. time sergeant doe and his allies overthrew the government uh these practices uh had become again like central to the the nature of public authority and guys like tolbert probably maybe aren't actually doing anything certainly not aren't doing some of the stuff that other people will do but when these indigenous folks come into power, they have this expectation that like, this is what you do when you're in power. Mm. These practices are both how you cement your power publicly and also how you ensure that you won't lose it. Right. So Doe founds a new military junta government with himself at the head. Most of the people that he let run the country are members of the Kron ethnic group because Doe is Kron. They had been traditionally a fairly minor group in terms of their like numbers and power in the country. But Doe puts them at the center of a building shit show. The government he headed was at least as brutal and violent as the one he'd replaced. And by the way, the Firestone Plantation keeps right on chugging along. Because Doe was all about that for a brief moment. But well, Doe you. comes in in part to be pro U.S. Right? He's very right. he doesn't want he doesn't want to fuck up things for business. You know, like because he obviously understands that he US underst- alliance yeah. is beneficial to him. And, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's he's all about that. Um. So yeah, they they do all they're nasty as shit. One of the. One of the in, most infamous moments, like right after taking power, when everyone's still kind of like, because again, Liberia prior to this had been, they were very integrated into African, the continent. Like there's all these different yeah. economic and 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 political organizations that are four different, that all of these Af- multiple African states will be a part of, right? So even before... Um, uh, well, yeah, they're like integrated in, in Africa, yeah. But even so, as a colonized state, it was still like not... It wasn't like shitty, <laughs> like before they became like ba- like before it was black imperialized. It was still a colony, right? Uh, no, no, no. It, we, it was established by the U.S. Like it had just been people uh, living in Africa. Like okay. when, no, I'm, I'm talking. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the government Doe overthrows, right? The Tolbert government, yeah. the the America Liberian government. They're integrated into the political. Okay, sorry, I was going map way of too Africa, far back. right? I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so sorry. all of these, when he overthrows the government, all of these, he arrests all of these government officials. Mm-hmm. Who who have who are like friends with the people running Nigeria and like Kenya right. and all of these other countries, right? They they're in political organizations together. They're like d- managing trade deals. They're going on vacation. They're, they're like they are they are buds with the other people who are in power mm-hmm. in Africa. And now they're in prison. And Doe, in a surprise moment, has them all executed by drunken soldiers on television. So Holy shit. Oh my god, this, television. I forgot yeah. how modern this was. Fucking yeah. hell. This is like the 80s, baby. Oh my god. So 
this this really pisses off a lot of other people in like a lot of other African governmental leaders, right? Because like that's my fucking buddy you just right. shot in the street. Like what the fuck, dude? Yeah. Jesus um, Christ, man. So this causes a lot of folks in the international community to support his ouster. Uh, still, though, the Reagan administration is like hey, you're willing to let us land planes there. Like, we'll play ball, you know? Uh, they they invite Doe to the White House. He meets with the president where Ronald Reagan, in what it might be an early senior moment, refers to him as Chairman Mo instead of Chairman <laughs> Doe. And Doe just kind of, like, goes oh with it, you know? God. Oh, my God. We have to, have, we have to stop having these... No, I not know, to be I ageist, know. but there has to be... A no, it's okay. To running a Look, fucking country. Fucking, you look there's things we we we're all fine with the idea that you can be too young to do certain things mm -hmm. okay maybe yeah. you can be too old to do certain things you're right um, exactly even now yeah. i mean not to whatever there are so many moments where like I, be in congress look yeah just oh my god we're being governed yes. by people that are slowly fading away and yeah. not competent anymore. Look, you anymore. can't be president until 35, which is an implicit acknowledgement that the age you are impacts your ability to do the job property. Anyway, this is this is a rant f no, for right. elsewhere. Uh, yeah, another conversation yeah. another day. Yeah. Yeah. So Mo which is what Reagan calls him, uh, <laughs> assures the Reagan administration <laughs> that Liberia is totally going to return to democracy, December of 1985, right? Need a couple of years to get stuff into shape, right? Get uh, Purge the government of all these bad people. You know, I'm going to fix stuff up and then I'm going to stop being dictator, right? 1985, we're a democracy, baby. Um, so Mo knows he does have to hold, or Doe knows he just does have to hold an <laughs> <Yeah>. election. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that made me laugh. Go ahead. Yeah. He knows he's got to hold an election, um, but he also knows that, like, I, I'm i not going to have an, a real election. So of he does the not. kind of shit dictators do. Right. You know, um, the, he and he cracks down every time political parties will rise up, he'll find excuses to arrest them. He's constantly arresting and purging people, including other folks he'd carried out the coup with. Um, and obviously, a, a lot of resistance starts to bubble up to his regime. And the nexus of antidote sentiment forms around a woman named Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, she's an economist who'd been educated in the U.S. and had worked as an executive for Citibank. She decided to run for election alongside Jackson F. Doe, who is not related to Sergeant Doe, right? Okay. Separate Doe's. Um, in the and States. they She's in the States she, still, she comes or? back. She comes back. Okay. That's one of the things she gets a lot of, like, early kind of respect is she, like, leaves the U.S. to go back to Liberia to run. Oh. Um, so they run for president uh, with the Liberian Action Party. Uh, the election is held largely so the bad dough, I'm going to call them good dough and bad dough okay. from this point on because it's going to get too confusing yeah, anyways. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and, and Doe's doing this because there's like $93 million in U.S. aid funds um, that he wants, but he has to do an election first. Mm -hmm. uh, so in quotes, election, right? He wins the election, but yeah. like ev immediately in every like independent observer is like, well, that was completely fraudulent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> US, the U.S. decides to work with bad dough anyway because again, he's smart than Tolbert. He's not going to like say no to the right. U.S. military establishment. So Doe sets to work carrying out, happily carrying out an ethnic cleansing in Nimba County where Jackson Doe had called home because he gets to see where people are voting against him. Oh, he he burns their ballots and then he sends his soldiers to massacre them. Um, so, so the his election most... was a way just to see where he's hated the most. Yep, then... yep, yep. Fucking hell, man. Okay. Mm -hmm. So his, you know, again, the troops carrying out these massacres are mostly Kron like him, right? Because again, he's very much, a, and there's other ethnic groups that are kind of allied with the Kron, right? Mm -hmm. um, this does really break down on like racial lines, tribal lines, kind of whatever you want to call it. Um, but so he sends his Kron soldiers into this region, which is inhabited by other other peoples, um, and he massacres a shitload of them because he, he sees them as like enemies of the regime. Um, and whenever he captures men who he had been like, political leaders agitating against him. Uh, he'll have them mutilated and have their corpses paraded through the streets so soldiers can cut off pieces to eat or keep as souvenirs. Mm. Um, this isn't good for the economy, Shireen. Now, I'm not an economic expert, but I, I, I'm not surprised to hear that this was like bad for money. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, you might not want to invest in a country where this is going on quite as much, you know? Um, 
And televisions the, exist, remember? So this yeah. is tele, this is it's able to be documented. Yeah. Which is People wild. are looking at this and like, well, maybe I'm gonna pause on some of those develop those building funds yeah. for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to wait until this parading corpses thing is over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See so, how yeah, it shakes out. So further so economic disturbing. problems are caused by the fact that the Minister of Procurement, shoe designer Charles Taylor, had embezzled something like a million shoe dollars. Shoe designer? Yeah, Chuck Taylor's. He's the he's the what of what? He's the guy who designed the Chuck Taylor. No, no, before shoes. what was his what Charles was his... Taylor? Well, he's the he's the minister of procurement for Liberia. Yeah, t- why do you say that as if it was like duh? Like, well, how is that a thing? You know, you've heard of Ch- Chuck Taylor. I know, the shoes. I've heard. Yeah, but like, I didn't know the yeah. inventor of fucking Converse uh-huh. was. Yeah, yeah, he's fucking he's hell. he's gonna be he's a Liberian warlord. Oh my Don't god! Don't look that up. Is that something um, everyone knows again? I just like. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, definitely uh, common knowledge. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I'm willfully ignorant so much of my time, so much of my my life. I just can't handle this. It, I, that was a lie, Shireen. I'm sorry. I can't do what? this to you anymore. Yeah, I was lying. There, About there, everything I, I just, Taylor? I, it was just a joke. Well, no, there's a Charles Taylor and he embezzles a million dollars from the Liberian you government and becomes a warlord Robert, later. The world is so fucked up and crazy. I don't <laughs> believe anything you say. Like, I, I, know, I, I legit know. was going to burn my fucking converse after this fucking episode. I can't believe. I, it, was, it was It was just a joke because it get I'm like Chuck Taylor's Charles Taylor. I thought it was funny. I'm way too gullible when it comes I know, to you. I know. It's, I'm going to get roasted the on the internet. I don't fucking care. Whatever. No, I mean, Shireen, this is why I tell everybody one lie. You should never trust me. Never trust Robert. <laughs> I don't never trust, I trust me. you. Oh, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe there's a level of me that trusts you. This, but isn't, also... this isn't on you. This is on me, Shireen. He's a liar. You said Firestone. Like, Firestone was, is already like. No, that, of... that's all real. You can, I know. That's why we provide sources. Look. That, okay, that's the thing. I know the Firestone thing is real, but it doesn't mean it's so far out that another fucking big American brand is rooted in I know, because like shoes are. and rubber. I mean, again, this we I, we I could have just gone through with this and just waited for people on Twitter to get really angry or on, on Reddit to get really angry at me. Shows you wouldn't growth. do that. To me. Robert, I felt bad. That I felt shows bad. Growth. I felt bad. Good job. I felt bad. I felt Don't bad. Don't worry, Shereen. he's lied to me too. Mm-hmm. I lie to everybody once. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I. Well, now I haven't lied to you yet, Shireen, but I'll figure one out. Lying is the most human quality you can have, so it's it's fine. I understand. Uh... You don't have I'm to. Do, so excited you don't for have, Reddit. So I'm just kidding. You don't I don't have to no, it's okay. Don't, Shireen, trust me. I'm the one who's gonna look bad as a result. Why? Of this. No. It's. I mean, because you were so earnest about being angry about the Converse guy being the warlord. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. This is to all my gullible people out there. I represent you. I hear uh, it, you. I see I, I, you. It ha- I have to say, it would have been really funny if if the actual Chuck Taylor guy had been a Liberian warlord. Like that would have been hilarious. So Taylor had been born in Liberia, but his dad was an Americo Liberian. Um, uh, his mom, though, he's he's mi- he's mixed kind of between Americo Liberian and his mom is a member of the indigenous Gola tribe. Now that said, he is raised as an Americo Liberian, right? Like the fact that his dad is means that um, there's obviously one of the things you have to say about Liberia, like kind of the racial caste system is not nearly what it is in like colonies that are, are run by white people. Mm-hmm. Um, so Taylor benefits, even though his mom is indigenous and his dad is Americo Liberian, he's raised Americo Liberian. He attends college in the United States, Bentley College in Massachusetts. Somebody else will have gone there and be like, holy shit. Once we <laughs> talk about this guy, holy shit, this dude went to my alma mater. Um, he's, but, but the point is his early life, he's thoroughly Americanized. He speaks English very like he's, I mean, obviously, actually, I should I should note here they all speak English. English is the official language of Liberia. If you go to Liberia, like you don't need to learn. And now some of the like there, there's a patois, like accents are kind of different, right. like sort of like it is in in um, parts of Louisiana. But it's English. Like you listen to these like interviews with warlords and shit. There, they're all speaking in English and stuff. Because um, again, it's a colony of the right. United States, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But he is, he's not just, like, he's hes incredibly Americanized. Um, his previous political experience came from rising through the ranks of a Liberian expat organization in Philadelphia. Uh, and when he flies back, uh, or so he, 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 he goes back to Liberia 
uh, after Doe's revolution and gets a job in the government. And then he embezzles a bunch of money and he gets kicked out. So he flees to the U.S. because he doesn't want to get executed and paraded through the streets. Right. Doe tries to extradite him because he had almost certainly actually committed the crimes he was being accused of. Um, Charles Taylor is initially arrested by the United States and we keep him in a correctional facility for two years while we're trying to decide what to do to the man. But then, and I'm going to quote again from the Liberian Civil Wars, the story grows rather murky. Taylor escaped from Plymouth House on the evening of September 15th, 1985, apparently with the help of the CIA, responding to an obvious reluctance on the part of the government to extradite Taylor to face almost certain execution at the moment he landed. It is also possible that the CIA felt Taylor might be useful, because if someone replaced or toppled Doe, Taylor certainly seemed the most likely to do so. Either way, the popular version of the story has it that Taylor and three fellow escapees cut through prison bars with hacksaws before lowering themselves to the ground outside on knotted bedsheets sheets. More realistically, perhaps, arrangements were made for his cell to be left unlocked one night, and he simply walked out. He was picked up by his wife, Jewel, at a local freeway exit, after which he dropped out of sight. For a few months later, he reappeared in Ghana, having traveled to Africa via Mexico. In Ghana, he was arrested immediately on suspicion that he was somehow involved with the CIA, which tends to lean credence to the latter version of his escape. Taylor's lawyer at the time was Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General. So certainly there was money and influence floating around somewhere. No charges were ever brought against Taylor in America for his escape. So he gets over to Ghana um, <laughs> and while he's in the US, he spends two years in custody, right? He gets, uh, the CIA kind of smuggles him out. Well, all this is happening. Doe is in power in Liberia, but there are constant coup attempts, right? Or at least attempts at coup attempts that Doe cracks down on. And every time there's the threat to his reign, he does the same thing. He sends his soldiers to that region of the country and he massacres all of the men that he can find, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and often, like, you know, rapes the women, kills baby, like, it's ugly shit. Stuff. It's, it's ethnic stuff. cleansing yeah. kind of shit. It's really nasty. Um, yeah. So by 1987, Doe has murdered a lot of people um, and he has repeatedly purged ethnic groups. Um, so that's around the time when Charles Taylor makes his way to the Ivory Coast and he he meets a guy who's like a friend of the Ivorian president who decides to back him in his plans to overthrow Doe. Now, by this point, Doe has made the major mistake of pissing off Muammar Gaddafi um, because he, <laughs> oh, oh, again, he's on the side of the United <laughs> States, mm -hmm. right? Um, and he, the United States, I don't know if you're aware of this, not big fans of Muammar Gaddafi. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. No, so okay, Doe expels Libyan diplomats from his capital. Now, this is a problem because not only is Qaddafi kind of a petty dude, he also runs a gigantic pan-ideological training camp for insurgents, right? If you are an insurgent and you want to learn how to build bombs and shoot people, Muammar Qaddafi's got you. You're yeah. the IRA, you're the you're, you're Palestinian organ. Like, he don't give a shit. Like, Muammar will take, as long as you're, like, cool with Muammar, he'll he'll train your dudes, you know? Yeah. Um, 1 800 Muammar for all yeah, of your Yeah, 1 800 Muammar yeah. for all of your insurgent needs. <laughs> exactly. So he and he and Taylor. So uh, Muammar Gaddafi Doe pisses him off. And so Gaddafi's like, well, I, I'm going to fucking get back at that son of a bitch. Um, and he hears there's this motherfucker named Taylor who's got connections to the government uh, of, you know, in the Ivory Coast and shit. Um, and so he and Taylor get into contact. And in very short order, a number of militants who are like on Taylor's side. These are like generally like Liberians who've had to flee the country because they were also associated with some sort of rebellion or another that Taylor's gathering to him. These folks go over and get trained in Libya, right? Um, and again, good chance there's some CIA involvement here. It's very murky. Um, I assume they're everywhere. So Yeah, they're always doing some yeah. shit. I mean, they certainly seems to have like helped Taylor get out, right? Mm -hmm. Qaddafi's maybe more a bigger part of like how he actually gets to carry out his whatever. Uh, on December 24th, 1989, Charles Taylor and 168 insurgents enter Liberia through uh, the Ivory, or yeah, the Ivory Coast. Um, Chuck makes an announcement through the BBC using a satellite phone he'd been given by somebody. Uh, again, who knows where he gets this kind of shit, that he has no personal ambitions for higher office. He just wants to liberate his people from President Doe. Uh, open civil war results, resulting in bits in, uh, breaking out in kind of bits and pieces here and there. Um, and gradually, like, 
T- Taylor's forces start to make progress. They're pretty well organized. They're competent. They expand quickly. And more and more of the country starts to fall out of Doe's ability to control because he's not really popular because of all the massacres. Right. So he starts having his security forces round up hundreds and hundreds of residents of the capital from ethnic groups he viewed as rebellious. And these people just disappear. Some of them do show back up headless on the streets. Damn. So citizens of the capital start greeting each other with the phrase, glad to see you've still got your head. Oh. Um, Members of their, yeah, and members of the ethnic groups targeted by Doe's purges start flooding into Taylor's growing army, right? They, they get away from wherever the president controls, and a lot of them pick up guns. Uh, as they won victories, they replaced the initial weapons that they invade with. The army's mostly equipped with these old Soviet, Soviet like World War II era submachine guns, mm-hmm. uh, PPSHs. And they gradually replace these with U.S. M16s uh, from Doe's dead U.S.-backed fighters. Um, and yeah. once his regular forces start to get real rifles, he hands these submachine guns off to little kids. Uh, and he uses them to form what he calls his small boy units. Oh, God. Quote, from the Liberian Civil Wars. The bulk of advancing forces were locally recruited youth, handed guns and fortified by alcohol and cheaply sourced Chinese amphetamines, known colloquially as bubbles, and of course, a great deal of local marijuana. In much the same way as the Kron dominated AFL, that's Doe's party, took excruciatingly violent revenge against Gio and Mano, these are other ethnic groups, roving bands of armed youth singled out Kron and Mandingo for similar treatment. Newsreel images of the Liberian Civil War, as the initial coup of it inevitably became, came to be characterized by images of of children and young people, both male and female, dressed in civilian clothes, often in wigs and bizarre fancy dress, enacting scenes that might have been extracted from Lord of the Flies. These were the first high-profile displays of child soldiers at work in the African context of war, and the spectacle was utterly terrifying. Wow. So that's where we're going to end for today. (laughs) What a high note to just leave me on. Good vibes. Yeah. (laughs) Um... Yeah. Well, I was hoping that, I mean, I was hoping there was going to be more, more uh, witchy stuff, to be honest. That's stuff that's been interesting to me. There will be next episode. Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be an interesting, or it'll be interesting. It's not going to be much of a, um, you'll want to go elsewhere to learn in detail some more discussion of that. But we will talk about kind of one expression of these things from people who are like power hungry grifters. Mm, okay. um, you're not going to get a great sense of what the actual religious practices were among these Yay. people. Uh, yeah, but you I will mean, see some folks doing fucked up shit and then yeah. deciding I mean, to be point, born again Christians. Yeah, at this point, I'm not like at a certain point when and this is just me theorizing and not don't take any of these blanket statements seriously. But I would imagine that at a certain point when like a religion or a practice is just used to gain power, it's more used for the violence versus the belief. You know, I'm not like, I'm not yep. convinced so many people believe it. I'm just convinced they're using it to benefit themselves yeah. or like, you know, so that's just like, well, it's, it's one of those things. I, like there's, you know, you talk about cannibalism and, and other kind of beliefs that involve taking pieces of the body. Certainly thousands of years ago, there were groups doing that in Africa as there were in many other parts of the world for different reasons. But the ki- what you're going to see during the Liberian Civil War has about as much is is related to those be- those indigenous belief practices in the same way that like a modern Baptist revival meeting is related to a Christian church meeting in like 850 AD, you know, mm-hmm. to like a, a church service in 850 AD. Yeah, there is like a line of descendants from one to the other, but it's changed tremendously right. over time for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And a, someone partaking in the 850 AD church service might look at a modern one and be like, well, I don't really know what the fuck's going on here, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <sighs> well, anyway. Any uh, plugs at the end here, Shereen? I'm Shireen. Um, Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly. Uh, I'm on Twitter, ShiroHero666. Instagram is just ShiroHero. Um, I'm honestly, like, I'm not really on the internet much these days. Uh, I'm trying... have an impulse to delete everything all the time, but I think I just need it just for this kind of stuff. Uh, But um, follow me if you want. I'm posting less, but the stuff I post, gold, you know, so just stick around for that. Um, Yeah. But I will say, I was thinking about this as you were teaching me all these terrible things. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like, like sometimes I get frustrated, for example, that no one knows the history of Palestine or Syria or whatever. And there's like selective things, as you said, like people can 
there's so many there's so much bullshit and violence and terrible things in the world you can only learn so much about it you can only handle so much of it so i for one am happy i know about this terrible thing because yeah. <laughs> i maybe was ignorant before and i hope people feel that way when they learn about other ter terrible things that they should yeah about, you know Context is important, not because it mitigates bad things, but it's like, it would be fucked up to just get angry about the IRA bombing a bar and not recognize that that act of terrorism was directly influenced by the genocide of half of the Irish population, right? Yeah, that yeah. would be fucked up. It, likewise, yes, it's bad to, it's, it's certainly bad to like shoot missiles into cities like uh hamas does but also that's not happening in a vacuum exactly and it's happening in response to missiles being shot into there and a bunch of other fucked up shit yeah. this history of like really horrible things and likewise it is bad to make ch recruit child soldiers and carry out human sacrifices yeah. it's not they didn't just decide to do that because liberians are brutal all of this occurred as part of a continuum of things that is heavily influenced by U.S. policy yeah. and is heavily influenced by colonialism. Yeah. Um, again, it's just it's not a matter of like saying, well, this isn't bad because of this bad thing. It's a matter of you don't understand what's happening if you if you're only focused on one part of this yeah. picture. And the thing is, the information we all receive is usually funneled through a white supremacist fucking colonial you know what i mean like it's all funneled through a different a certain lens to make us think certain people are good certain people are bad so i don't know use your brains i suppose i will also yeah, try to just, use mine to i don't think fucking converse are evil yeah yeah <laughs> attack destroy your converse shoes um light their headquarters on fire um, um, no <laughs> hunt down their corporate representatives in the street oh, no vengeance can be enough for converse um, well, Robert, on another note, yep. we should probably uh, pl plug two new podcasts on Cool Zone Media that that are recently out, shouldn't we? We have we, what are now, Sophie? Real quick sidebar: <laughs> what what is a podcast? All right, so <laughs> like, this does is, not know where that was going. That was great. I was like, is he actually doing this? Is, is it like an edit note? Like, no, okay, no, this no, is no. This, bit. this yeah. is this is a bit, but also this is why I'm in charge. Um, we have that, two. That, there's <laughs> Sophie. This is like ten percent of why you're in charge. <laughs> We have uh, two new podcasts on Cool Zone Media that you should check out if you haven't checked them out already. We have uh, Ghost Church by Jamie Loftus, which is a Ghost Church fascinating podcast about American spiritualism. Jay Loft, yes, and Jamie. we all and we also have uh, Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff, hosted by Margaret Kiljoy, that is in fact about cool people who. Mm -hmm. did cool stuff um it's like it's like the allegedly the, it's the uplifting version of whatever the fuck this podcast is you know what i yeah. mean like it's <laughs> yeah it's great Shereen, actually yeah. shireen there's some really cool people who do some really cool stuff in this next allegedly episode. okay are you familiar with the story of liz estrada okay, i don't know robert, just I stop talking robert okay <laughs> Um, but yeah, check check those podcasts out. Shireen, Shireen actually works on cool people who did cool stuff, and she allegedly, is a, and allegedly, and both Robert and Shireen are, are guests or upcoming guests, depending on when this drops on the show. So check it out. We, yeah. I'm so happy, Shireen. Working with Margaret has taught you the most important thing about being an anarchist, which is saying allegedly before oh. <laughs> almost any statement. <laughs> yep, it's, uh, yep, in my vocab forever. And that is the episode. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.